Jeff Shara. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So where are you now? Uh, I am in Gettysburg. Um, and where I am, and if you see this sort of bizarre mess behind me, uh, I'm in the attic of an old historic <laughs> home called Red Patch. It was built by a Union general in 1900, and we've bought it. And we're in the process of renovating it and fixing it up, and that's kind of what I'm doing today with a sledgehammer and all of that. And it's a great deal of fun to do it this way, but this is a cool historic home and once it's finished it'll be it'll be spectacular as i'm i can actually look past the camera out the window here and i can see little round top which is very cool so your new book to wake the giant by the time this airs it will be out but as we're speaking now it's still about a week or so away uh and i was it was curious to me that in the in, your introduction you talk about the fact that you still get nerves oh absolutely uh, I mean, you know, every book that comes out, I mean, I, I, I go through this like self-torture. Um, is this the one that's going to bomb? Is this the one people are going to write me and say, oh, this is awful. Um, and I, I, that's my own personal, you know, the cross I bear. Um, we did get one review so far, which was spectacular. So that, that's supposed to make me feel better, but I'm, I'm still nervous about it. <laughs> No, I can imagine, especially with the density of information and research that you do on these, I'm sure you're always sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop on something, right? Well, yeah, and then of course I get people catch, people love to catch mistakes. Yeah. Um, and it's like some people that's a hobby. Uh, and you know, nobody's perfect and, and in, inevitably something will slip through the, the editing process. We fix it later on in the paperback. Um, but that's not the concern this time. The, the greater concern this time is the conspiracy theorists because, you know, Pearl Harbor has inspired all kinds of work that has nothing to do with Pearl Harbor. It's all about FDR and he was conspiring with the Japanese emperor to start the war and all. And there's some, you know, some legitimate historians out there have written some horrible books about this, you know, because it sells books. Uh, but the problem is people believe that stuff. And I've already gotten a little bit of it. And I, I, my job is to tell the story and to get it as accurate as I can and I've answered these questions already that, you know, no, FDR did not know. And here's, here's the way I put it. And I love the way someone explained conspiracy theory is that <clears throat> you read something in, in hindsight, because it's easy to read in hindsight. And you say, you know, particularly with Pearl Harbor, they should have known. Then that phrase evolves into they must have known. And then that phrase evolves into they knew. And that's what I'm up against. And so, you know, as I've said, I said, I say it in the book and I've said it live that, um, no, this is the story. This is what happened. And there was blindness and stupidity and ignorance on both sides. Uh, and that's part of the story. And you can't just tell the story of Pearl Harbor by talking about bombs falling on ships. I mean, that's two hours. This book covers a year. It starts a year before. And, you know, if I just wrote bombs falling on ships, that would get pretty uninteresting after about 20 pages. Um, but to lead up to it, that's my job. And that part of it, I feel really good about. And it's interesting you say that because one of the things I felt as a reader, especially toward the end when you're sort of doing the, the looking back, what went wrong uh, aspect, everyone's really pretty clear I messed up. We missed this. I mean, there's actually a lot of honesty and transparency and uh, throughout the process and, uh, but yet still it got twisted. Yeah. And uh, actually that, uh, that sort of self-evaluation goes on in Japan too. They made mistakes. I mean, the Japanese could have done a much more thorough job of destroying our Navy had they not made a couple of really, you know, dumb mistakes and they own up to it I mean, they know exactly what happened so it's 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 human you know this, this is a human story and that doesn't mean just emotions it means you know human failings and human successes and human bravery and you know it, it's it's the whole package and that's what got me excited about doing this story and speaking of the human aspect that's where we begin uh in early december 1940 uh, and the story begins with Seaman Tommy Biggs. Tell exactly. Tommy, 
Tommy is a, a child of the, of the Depression. Um, you know, he's 19 years old, and he basically has nothing in his life. I mean, he's, a, he's graduated from high school, and that's it. And the one thing he can do is baseball. He's a good baseball player. But there's really, I mean, he's in Palatka, Florida, and, and anybody who knows Florida, that's northeast, and south of Jacksonville, and there's not much going on there in the in the Depression. Um, his father is a, a very unhappy man who has nothing, can't do anything for his family. Well, Tommy realizes he wants to get out. He has got to escape, and he his his best friend uh, says, "Hey, you know, I'm I've talked to a." Uh, a Navy recruiter in Jacksonville, I joined the Navy. And, and Tommy is floored by that. He, he can't even imagine why anybody would do that. But his friend talks him into uh, going into Jacksonville and talking to the guy. And that's sort of where the story begins. Why was it important to start this story through Tommy's eyes? I, did, I didn't want to start like this is a civics lesson. So you have Cordell Hall, who's the Secretary of State, you know, for, for Roosevelt. He's a key voice in this story. But to start the story in Washington, D.C., with a bunch of guys sitting around having a conversation, that's really not a good place to begin. And then on the, on the, on the flip side of that is to start in Japan, uh, again, with conversation. I mean, nobody's dropping bombs yet. And, you know, I get there, I take you there eventually, but you needed to see where these poor guys came from. You know, the guys who were on the ships, like, as I said before, dropping the bombs on the ships, these guys who were on the ships, and who are they, and where did they come from? You talk in your introduction about the fact that the exploration and telling of the story uh, was a lot more overwhelming than you expected. Yeah, there are very few veterans left, and in fact, today, and, and I mentioned this, uh, um, the uh, when I began the research on this story, there were six living veterans on the USS Arizona. A lot of people don't realize that there were 350 survivors on the Arizona. 1,100 were killed, but 350 survived. Well, today, as I'm talking to you, there are two. And these fellows are in their mid-90s. And the most recent one to pass away was named Don Stratton. And he wrote a book. He was there. And he talks about what it smelled like and felt like and the heat and the, you know, and what he saw. That had to be tough for him, but it may have also been very cathartic for him. Um, but when he passed away, and this has been not more than a couple months ago now, it, that was a blow because um, he was there and he, unlike a lot of guys, he was willing to share his story and willing to, to educate people so they would not forget these guys. Now, when, when people like that are gone, as, as I mentioned, there's no one left to tell their story. Um, that's my job. That's my role in this. I mean, I'm, I'm not the historian. I'm not the military historian. I'm a storyteller. And so I need to learn about these people. And it's emotional hearing their words, and, and not all of them are, were on the Arizona that I spoke to, and to hear what they went through, what they witnessed, civilians in Honolulu who were seeing this go on and any aircraft shells falling on their houses, what that was like. The Japanese Americans in Honolulu who are instantly under suspicion, and you know, some of them are killed, and what's that like for them? All of that adds up to, I mean, I'm sort of going on with this, but a lot, that all adds up to a very emotional package that when I'm putting words on the paper, I owe these people to get it right. What was it like for you and what has it been like for you to have to really get inside the action and the horror of what happens on the battlefield and in particular in Pearl Harbor? It's pretty horrific. It is pretty horrific. And I think that the, way, the best way to answer that is to tell the truth. This is what happened. And if this is uncomfortable for you, or if you, you, know, if you don't believe it, which is horrifying to think of, um, this is what happened. And I will stand by it. I will stand by every event, everything that happens, whether it's to Tommy Biggs, whether it's to Admiral Kimmel, uh, or whether it's to the Japanese, you know, on the, on the aircraft carriers as the planes are coming and going. Um, this is what they went through. And we need to know that. For a lot of readers, when you start, I know for me, the first thing I wondered was, is Tommy Biggs a real person in history or was he a composite? He's a composite. 
it is very rare to find that single, whether it's a sailor or a GI, a Marine, uh, who is everywhere I need him to be to tell the story. Now, you know, I, two of the three characters in this, in this book are very definitely real people, Admiral Yamamoto and, and Secretary of State Hull, but you need the composite character. You need the kid seeing everything. And that, that doesn't mean that the story is a lie, uh, because everything that happens to Tommy Biggs happened. And it might have just happened to three or four different people, including his best friend. Um, so, you know, again, that's the best way of telling the story. I mean, think about this. If Tommy Biggs uh, ends up in the, in the hold of a ship that's getting bombed, and well, like the Oklahoma, for example, that rolls over, that's the end of the story. I mean, Tommy Biggs is gone. And so you don't get anything else of what it was like for those sailors. So I need that composite character your heart breaks for that character too, because we look back on that era and think that those seamen were older than they were. And really many of them, as you said, came from very sheltered, intense poverty. They had never seen anything outside of their town. And uh, it was scary. And you felt that, you felt that fear of them having to go forward and sort of pretend that they were braver and more ready for this than anyone could be. Well, if you think about 1941, it has been, um, you know, 23 years since World War I. So everybody, almost everybody in the Navy, you know, except for the senior admirals, all the, all the kids, all the guys on the mm -hmm. ship, the petty officers and so forth, they've never seen combat. They've never faced an enemy. So they train and they drill and they do all this stuff constantly. It drives them crazy how much of it they have to do. But when the Japanese come, these guys are not prepared because they've never been in that situation. First time a bomb falls on their ship or a Japanese Zero fighter plane strafes the deck of the ship with, you know, machine gun bullets. This is a brand new experience for these guys. And some of them don't react very well. Some of them are, some of them are heroic. I mean, there are medals of honor, you know, given at Pearl Harbor. Um, so it, that's the part of this that's a little more complicated than people realize is that these guys, they're sailors and they're, you know, they're fighting for the USA. They've never fought before. This is all new. The title, To Wake the Giant, great title, of course, uh, comes from a quote from Admiral Yamamoto. Tell us about that. And was that always the immediate title? Was that the obvious choice right away? Or, or was it hard to, or is it hard to name your books? I agonize over every title. Um, it's, I mean, what I do is I'll make a list in my notes of a dozen or so titles and I'll send them up to my editor and she'll look at them and, you know, go, no, these are horrible, you know, so we start all over again. But yeah, the quote from Yamamoto is suspect. Um, it's quoted in movies, but, and I, and I changed the wording a little bit uh, from what he allegedly said so that I'm on safer ground. Um, I do have to say this, and, and I, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. The next book in this series will be the Battle of Midway, which is an extraordinary victory for the Americans. And I, what I floated to my editor is, since this book is called To Wake the Giant, the next title should be, hey, I told you not to wake that giant. She didn't go for that. So. <laughs> Too long. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right. Um, this is now. I was trying to count up because you've also done some books that um, Jeff, your, your the battlefield battlefield series. Uh, but for in terms of your historical novels, is this the seventeenth or eighteenth or have you well, lost this count? Is the, this is the sixteenth novel. Okay. The seventeenth book is my battlefields book, which is a nonfiction. It's the only that's the only nonfiction thing I've done. But yeah, this is my my sixteenth novel, um, and it's again. I, I guess I should feel really comfortable and happy about that, but I'm still terrified that, well, this is the one that's going to, you know, people are going to hate. And I, I need to see a shrink, maybe. With each one, the subject matter is always war. Um, and yet, I imagine each one is like a person or a character of its own uh, in that they're different and unexpected and reveal themselves in surprising ways. Was that the case in this? Did anything surprise you about uh, from when you started to where you ended up? Well, there are always surprises. I mean, in every book I've done, I mean, it, 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 I mean, I have the idea. First of all, I don't operate from an outline. A lot of writers okay. are taught to use an outline. Um, no, I, I mean, history is my outline. I mean, the events that happened, that's what I use. 
And the sometimes the hardest part is finding out where to begin. I mean, the ending of this book was much simpler than the beginning. <laughs> um, because, I mean, where, where do you start in October of 1941 or April of 1941 or December 1940? Um, that's tough because you have to, you have to look at the history, make sure you tell the story. And again, you don't want to overdo it or bore people, but you have to still have to get it right. Um, but I mean, I go back to my books on the American Revolution and I knew where the first one was going to end. It's really easy to come up with July 4th, 1776. Mm -hmm what's the beginning date? And it turned, ended up being 1770 with the, with the Boston Massacre. But I went in having no clue how that would happen. Um, and it always works itself out eventually. But that is a challenge, is knowing in some cases where you're going to begin, in some cases where you're going to end. Now, with this book, I mentioned Midway, there will be another volume, which will begin in the spring of 1942. Uh, so that's fairly easy because it follows, it's a sequel to this book. Um, but that's not always the case. What is your writing process like? Uh, I mean, these are, are massive stories that you're telling. Uh, and the demand is out there for them to be, <laughs> to show up kind of quickly on the bookshelves. Um, what what is a how do how does it begin for you? I know as you you've often said that you you start with those original sources like first person accounts and um, how, how do you begin cracking this open? Well, the the first step is to read a couple of the most prominent, well respected history books to get the facts straight. Prang, his book is the book when it comes to Pearl Harbor. If you're going to do the Civil War, you do Bruce Catton. You know, start with that. Then find the characters. Then find the first-hand accounts, the letters, the diaries, the memoirs. Um, and then that, you know, then I find the people because I have to find the voices pretty quickly. Um, I mean, I can't spend six months fumbling around wondering, you know, who, who are the characters going to be. So that's very important. The reading in any, in whenever possible, I go to the ground go there, walk the ground, see it. Pearl Harbor, we can do that. You know, we're very fortunate. You can stand above the wreck of the Arizona. You talk about emotional, that's emotional. Um, and so we, you know, the one place, the only place I couldn't go, uh, my last book was on the Chosen Reservoir campaign with the Marines in Korea. The Chosen Reservoir is in North Korea. And so my wife said, no, <laughs> you're not going to North Korea. So, okay, I won't do that. But no, walking the ground. And again, it's not a mystical thing. I'm not looking for ghosts, but just go there and see it and, and get a feel for what happened. That's enormously important. And only after all of that's done do I start writing. Um, the, the, the right, these people who can research and write and research and write, that would drive me insane. Uh, I have to do all the, the research first. Then I sit down and I start writing. And it, it's, I'm very fortunate that I can write seven days a week. You know, my father took seven years to write The Killer Angels because he had a real job. And, you know, he would write when he in his spare time. I'm very lucky I can do it, you know, full time. And so I'm, I'm doing it seven days a week. And which is why I can produce a manuscript in six months, because I never stop. And um, that, you know, I, I, a lot of people question that, like, how, you know, how can you write a book in a year? Um, especially as you, the word you used was massive. And that makes me cringe because I don't want people to think, oh my God, this, what is this, a dictionary? Um, yeah, but they are kind of massive. And um, it's, it's fun. At the end of the day, if it stops being fun, the books are not going to be very good, and I need to quit. I want to talk about your fans. So we're doing this on Zoom because obviously uh, you first time probably not doing a book tour in person, huh? I know, and I, I feel really sad about that. Um, I mean, I'm I'm sitting here. I've got my my here's my mask in my pocket, um, and it's it's a shame. Uh, and I've been to St. Louis. I've, I mean, that whole part of the country has been very good to me. Um, and it, I love meeting people face to face. I love doing book signings um, and I love talking to audiences. So unfortunately right now, this is the best we can do. When you're writing, uh, are the fans in your head as well as the characters or um, I, I've heard some authors say they almost feel they are in a conversation with, with the reader as they're writing, but I know it can be different for every writer. I've, I've never heard that question before. Um, and I, I guess the answer is no, um, because I'm there. 
and, and I've told many people this, my job is to take you with me back to the story, back to these people, back to the room, the battlefield, the ship, whatever it might be. Um, you know, so I'm not in the present. I'm, I'm back there. And if I'm doing my job, you'll come with me. Um, so I, I don't really think about, to me, I think if you're focusing on the reader, it becomes a little contrived. That's what I was saying about Hollywood before is that, you know, they're considering their audience and they have to, you know, consider the size of that audience. I'm considering the story. You know, my, again, it's about telling a good story. Going back to the novel, what's pointed out throughout the story and is obvious throughout the story is that this was a, a real turning point in how battles were fought and in, in how weaponry had advanced and was being used. I mean, just from a historical and tactical perspective, that's fascinating and obviously woven into the human story here. Um, you know, one of the things you talk about is that n nobody expected this particular threat. They thought it would come from the sea or from uh, other directions. Uh, tell me about that. Well, it, interestingly, the Japanese are so far ahead of us uh, in their study, and this is amazing, uh, the, the irony, their study of Billy Mitchell. You know, Billy Mitchell's the American Army uh, general who tries desperately to convince uh, the Navy that, you know, or, or, or the Army, the whole military, that an airplane can sink a ship. And people laugh at him. He's court-martialed. I mean, and, and again, the American military goes into the 1930s and the early 1940s having no clue, you know, what is it that's destroyed Pearl Harbor? Battleships these giant dreadnoughts with these huge 14 inch cannons. And you know, that, that's the most powerful weapon on earth. So we think the Japanese have studied Billy Mitchell and they've doing, done their own work. And they've actually, by the time you get to Pearl Harbor, um, they've perfected the, you know, the, the aircraft carrier plane, the planes that can land on the carriers, whether it's just fighter planes, torpedo plane, dive bombers. Um, I mean, they're so far ahead of us. And so when they come, and they come in the air from six aircraft carriers, they way outgunned us. And there are still people in Japan who think, no, 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 well, okay, this is a one-off. You know, they, we got to go back to the battleship. They're building the Yamato, largest ship ever built. Yamamoto hates this. It's look at the money you're spending to build that ship. You know how many fighter planes I could build with that money? And, but it's deaf ears. But what Yamamoto accomplishes with some of the people under him, Minoru Genda, who's in this book, is the, the air, he's the Billy Mitchell of Japan. Um, and what they accomplish in surprising us changes everything. It changes the history of the battles at sea. Because the one, you know, now the battleship is no longer the, the great invincible weapon. It becomes the aircraft carrier and the airplane. And that is brand new. And speaking of the aircraft carrier, you watch a documentary or you read anything on Pearl Harbor, you are sort of overcome by the sheer damage they inflicted that day. And yet back in Japan, Admiral Yamamoto knows the mistakes that were made. Well, and also he knows, and this is one of the great um, sort of conclusions from this book uh, and go all the way through it, the theme, and Yamamoto knows this is a terrible mistake. Uh, be, uh, again, the title, you know, to wake the giant. He knows, okay, this is going to give us six months. You know, and we, we need to get our act together, increase our you know, armament as much as we possibly can, prepare, because when the Americans get into this, they're going to be unstoppable. Well, other people in Japan are like, no, 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 no. You know, if we do this to, you know, the Americans, they're going to cut and run. They're going to pull all their, their ships back to San Francisco and Long Beach and Seattle because and, and, they don't want anything to do with a, with a war like this. Yamamoto doesn't believe that for a second. And that conflict in Japan causes them a lot of problems uh, down the road and ends up in the results of what happens at the Battle of Midway. And the fact that our aircraft carriers were not part of this attack uh, gives us a chance to wake up and, and recover. Yes, that is Yamamoto's biggest regret, is that the, you know, we had three aircraft carriers, one heads, heads back to the West Coast, Saratoga, the other two are out, um, out in the ocean, and they're not at Pearl Harbor. 
and the Japanese are bitterly disappointed about that because that was the Yamamoto knows that's the goal. You know, the battleships are all well and good. We want to sink those aircraft carriers and they don't get the opportunity. Well, that's what leads to the Battle of Midway is that, you know, that same opportunity. As you continue to explore this conflict, uh, what do you want your readers to walk away from this particular book, um, truly understanding and, and, and realizing? Well, first of all, one of the things is what we were talking, talking about before is the guys, um, that they're almost all gone. And I mean, there are a few, uh, but there are not many, and they're all in their 90s. And we have to remember them. We have to know their stories because they're not around to tell them anymore. And sometimes even if they are around, they don't want to talk about it. And that's something I've heard for years is, you know, just because you've got an old veteran sitting here doesn't mean he wants to tell you all his war stories. Um, and somebody cautioned me about that. Be careful of the guy who wants to tell you all his war stories because he probably didn't do any of that stuff. The guys who did the stuff, they're going to take that to their grave. So, People like me, I mean, I'm not patting myself on the back here, but, but I feel an awesome responsibility to keep those stories alive, to keep those stories out there. And, you know, whether it's, whether it's your grandfather or whoever it might be, um, even if it's some, you know, you have no connection at all to the Second World War, you got to know. You have to know what these, you know, what Tom Brokaw calls, you know, the greatest generation, what those people did because it saved the world. I mean, and that's not exaggeration. They saved the world. And I like telling that story. I want you to know, because I, that gives, I mean, I, I, you can tell by the way I'm talking about this. I mean, I, I build up enthusiasm for this. I mean, this, this is a passion for me. And I, I want it to be a passion for you. At the end of the book, you list the, uh, the victims. Uh, and it's very, it's very solemn and somber to, to to look at the size of that list and to see those individual names and know that they belong to somebody. And um, it's really heartbreaking. Well, and it's also important that I, you know, because all throughout the book, you know, we mentioned Tommy Biggs as a composite character, but all throughout the book, there are a whole bunch of characters, particularly a lot of crewmen on, on the Arizona, who are not composite characters. These are the real guys. Um, you know, the, the, the doctors, the, the two doctors um, that, that Tommy Biggs works with, the, uh, the, the, corn, the pharmacy uh, techs, the petty officers, on and on and on. These are real people. And none of them survived. And so at the end of the book, I just felt it, it was, I owed it to them. You know, I'm, I'm telling their story on the one hand. On the other hand, I owe it that you know who these people are. That you know, they're not just guys. They're not just composites. They're not made up people. These are crewmen on the Arizona who lost their lives, and officers, crewmen. You know, it doesn't matter. They're there, and to me, that was as important as anything I've done in this book. Jeff Shower, thank you so much for talking with us, and I hope that we get to see you here in St. Louis again with the next book. I hope so. <laughs> I hope I hope I don't have to you know wear the the mask again and that we're, we're through with all this because I look forward to coming there again definitely. And now I want to see what happens to that room. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can you put that up on your website? <laughs> yeah, I, it'll look a lot nicer. <laughs> <laughs>